Hey, what's up everybody, and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C, and we're going to do some more A&P today. Specifically, we're going to check out the pelvic bones, which would be fused bones called the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Let's do it. All right, so what we have here are two Roman skeletons, about 700 years old, I believe, that are holding hands. Uh, their hand bones have dissolved, as so has their feet bones. But um, can you tell by looking which one is the male and which one is the female? Now, you probably can based on just the simple height of the two skeletons. It looks like the one on top is probably the male. Are there any other clues that you can tell? Well, there are a couple of rocks on top of the, the pelvis of the skeleton on the bottom of the screen and it kind of obscures it a bit but there are some details we're going to learn about here with the pelvic bones and again we're talking about the bones right in here where the legs will be attached there are some major differences between the male pelvis and the female pelvis and when we learn the parts here we'll be able to compare the two and easily tell which one is the male and female so as we mentioned in the pectoral girdle talk the pectoral girdle was there to attach the limbs, and in this case, the upper limbs of a human known as the arms. So the pelvic girdle uh, would be the one in the lower part of the body that would attach the appendages that we call the legs. Now, we've seen some of the pelvic girdle before in that we've studied the sacrum. We'll put a check here, and we remember our sacrum. It's this kind of arrowhead-looking structure along with the coccyx that forms the tail of the vertebral column. Those, remember, are axial bones. The rest of the pelvic girdle here will be considered to be appendicular bones. So when you see this big, large, kind of, it looks more like an ear to me. And again, it's got a piercing in the lobe of the ear here. There are actually three bones that are fused together. The ilium, and I'll put a big I-L here for ilium. That's the large flared portion that looks like the ear to me, the the flappy part of the ear. The ischium is going to be down here and a little bit behind here that we can't really see. I can see part of it back here sticking out so like that. So there's another bone called the ischium. I'll put I-S-C-H just to show that. And then the third bone is called the pubis and it forms this middle part of the pelvis that connects in the midline of the body. These two branches of it that stick out are called the pubic bone or the pubis. So if you take the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis all together with the sacrum, we have what's called the pelvic girdle. Now, of course, I've already mentioned it, but it is here evolutionarily to attach the lower limbs, what we call the legs or the thighs in anatomy. But since we stand upright as a bipedal organism, it also transmits weight from the upper part of the body through the pelvis down into the legs and then ultimately into the feet and onto the ground. Yes, it does have a secondary function in that it does support some of the pelvic organs that are present in that area. Now, there are many names for these pelvic girdle bones, and I'm going to just be very careful here. I'm going to put an outline again around this big ear-looking thing with the lobe in the bottom. You could refer to that and its match on the other side over here, right? Still made of the same three bones, ilium, ischium, and pubis. But together, we usually call those either the coxal bones, could call them pelvic bones, right? the innominate bones, or sometimes called the os coxae, fancy way to say coxal bones. So wherever you're reading this on whatever website or textbook, you may see different terms for the same collection of bones. The pubic symphysis is where these two innominate bones, or these two co coxal bones, would meet up. So right here in the center, I'm kind of just drawing it in red so it stands out more, even though it's a little bit large. That would be the pubic symphysis. Now, we talked about this a little bit a long time ago in the histology chapter when we talked about fibrocartilage making up the pubic symphysis and that that type of cartilage is there to absorb shock. And that is a place there at the pubic symphysis where there is a lot of what we'd call pressure from this side of the body kind of pushing against that side of the body. So we want some fibrocartilage there as a shock absorber. Now, they form here, as it says, a pubic arch. 
that's going to be one of the critical things we'll look at when we're trying to derive whether this is a female or a male pelvis is to simply look at the angle of that pubic arch. So here we see side by side uh, some male pelvis, as you see spelled on the bottom, the plural for pelvis. And those would be over here on that side. On the left side would be the male pelvis. And on the right side of the screen are the female pelvis. So the male pelvis, again, that's the one on the left, is generally taller. And it is generally slenderer. That is, it is not as wide as the female pelvis. The iliac crest, which we haven't gotten to the talk yet, but it's right here. It's this part right in here. And then right at the front of it is what's called the superior anterior spine. Again, we're going to learn these terms in just a moment. But notice the thickness of it compared to the male crest, which is here I'm putting a box around, and the male superior anterior spine. So females have a much thicker iliac crest and a much thicker superior anterior spine. This gives a woman's hips those curviness that a male does not have usually. Okay, if you look at structure number one that's labeled there, we've already seen what's called the pubic arch. And in a male here, there's a little symbol for male, uh, you can see how narrow that pubic arch is compared to the female. We'll draw right there the female symbol. Shows how wide or curvy that pubic arch is. And you're kind of seeing the, the terms repeated here. Men have a more angular looking pelvis and women have a more curvy looking pelvis. Of course, this is to facilitate childbirth as well. So we can see some distances here on the bottom pelvis, the ones on the bottom part of the slide. There's a distance called the ischial spine distance, and that's distance two. You can see these little protrusions poking out here and poking out here, right? I'm drawing on the male pelvis. The distance between those is much shorter in a male than it is for a female, of course, to facilitate childbirth. That would also mean that structure three here, which I'll kind of outline like this, this perimeter of this thing called the pelvic brim. And you can definitely tell on the female pelvis on the right how much wider that pelvic brim is and how much smaller it is on the male. Looking, in, uh, looking at the tailbone, again, the coccyx and the lower part of the sacrum sticking down, and I'll just kind of show it like this, put the V here. You can see how the male uh, coccyx, the male tailbone, is totally in the way if you're trying to you know, deliver a child, that tailbone is going to cause some problems. So in the female pelvis, you should see the tailbone pushed more posteriorly uh, to make room again to facilitate childbirth. Okay, naming each individual piece of the innominate bone, again, that's what you can call that. You can call it a, a coxal bone if you want, or some of the pelvic bones. That's, those are all correct things. Let's put some terms to these pieces here. Let's start with the iliac crest, but let's illustrate it. So somewhere in here, and it's different for every book, you'll see it labeled a little bit differently. I'm just going to put IC for iliac crest somewhere right around there. And then what we, what we usually jump into uh, in formal lectures are the four spines of the ilium. And remember, I'll just write it again here so we don't forget it. This is the ilium up here. Uh, if you spelled that I-L-E-U-M. If you put an E there, it would actually describe one of the digestive tubes called the ilium. Uh, so let's make sure we spell ilium with two I's, I-L-I-U-M. So there's the iliac crest on that flared portion. Now let's take a look at the spines. This is the anterior superior iliac spine, meaning that's in the front anterior, and it's the one on top, anterior, superior, iliac spine. If you put your hands on your hips, as they say, and you feel those bony protrusions sticking out forwardly, anteriorly, you can actually palpate those anterior, superior, iliac spines. Now, the anterior, inferior one is right below it here, so I'll put anterior, inferior, iliac spine. Of course, to find the posteriors, you just roll over to the back of the bone. So the posterior superior is here. I'll put posterior superior iliac spine. And the one underneath it is the posterior inferior iliac spine. So there's the major parts of the ilium you see on almost 
from high school level up into the higher anatomical levels, those are the main parts you talk about of the iliac portion of the innominate bone. Now, let's change our color just a little bit here. The sciatic notch, this is the greater sciatic notch right here. And it's called that because it's the larger one. Now we're going to see here a lesser sciatic notch. And that's how you can spot those. They're on the back of the bone. They're on the posterior side where you see those posterior superior and inferior spines of the ilium. So we do see the two sciatic notches, which will facilitate structures, including the sciatic nerve passes through those areas. Now in between them right here is the spine of the butt bone, if you want to call it that. So remember talking right about here somewhere would be the bone called the ischium. I'll kind of write it here if it will show up. The ischium. So the spine sticking out in between the two sciatic notches is called the ischial spine, and I'll just write it like that so I don't confuse it from any other spine. And then below that, this lump down here that's very prominent when we see the innominate bone from the posterior side. This is called the ischial tuberosity. I'll just change my pen so we can see it. I-T, the ischial tuberosity. The next part I usually deal with is the bowl. And bulum is kind of means like a small bowl. Aceta is an old word or a root word referring to oil. So when you say acetabulum, like they pronounce in English, an acetabulum is a vinegar bowl or an oil bowl. What people used to wash their fingers in before there was, you know, plumbing inside of a house, they would dip their fingers into a bowl full of vinegar to clean off their fingers before eating. And I think you can see the acetabulum. I'm going to put a red ring around it right here. There's the acetabulum. It looks like something's going to fit in there, and you're right. That's where the head of the femur, or the thigh bone, will fit in, connected by some ligaments. Now, if you can look inside the bowl, the vinegar bowl, the acetabulum, there's a smaller bowl right here. That's called the acetabular fossa. Again, fossa meaning an indention or a depression in a bone. So within the acetabulum, which I'll just label with big A, is an acetabular fossa. Inside there, you'll find a ligament that hooks onto the fovea capitis of the femur bone when we see the details of it in the next talk. Now, this next structure here, the acetabular notch, is a little tricky to find. I can outline it right here. And if you could turn that bone just a little bit, you'd notice that that acetabulum, that vinegar bowl, has a crack in the side of it. Almost looked like someone took a bite out of a styrofoam cup, if you've ever done that before. So there is the acetabular notch, and it is tough to see from that aspect. If I could push this bone backwards a little bit and kind of tip the ilium over, I could see that acetabular notch a lot better. Okay, now we've seen most of the structures here dealing with the ilium and the ischium and the acetabular features. The only thing we're missing now is the pubic bone or the pubis. So I'll change colors again, and you can really find the pubis bone easily because it surrounds this large hole here called the OF, the obturator foramen. And it's going to be a large nerve called the obturator nerve that's going to go through there at some point in our future. Now, I said you can see the pubic bone, but in this aspect, it's hard to see the whole thing. So let me get rid of a little bit of my acetabular ink here. And I can do it like this. It's going to come out like a point. Now, some of it's hidden behind the acetabulum. That's the problem with this aspect is some of it's hidden from us. But this down here is a branch, and this up here is a branch of the pubic bone. And then we have something sticking out as a point right there. And that's how to find these last three parts. So the inferior pubic ramus, ramus meaning branch, is right there. This would be the superior, oops, let me do that again, the superior pubic ramus, spelled out for you right there. And you can barely see it, so I put a star there just to indicate this one. You can't see very well from this aspect. A lot of it's hidden behind the acetabulum. Uh, but the pubic crest sticks out fairly well. I'll just put PC here 
for the pubic crest, making up anything in blue there would be part of the pubic bone. Okay, so there's a pr pretty good run through of the posterior aspect of the bone. But what if we flip it over? Uh, obviously, the acetabulum is going to vanish from our sight, but what else can we see if we look at the anterior view of the anomena bone? Let's check it out. Okay. Iliac crest again, somewhere in here, depending on which text you're looking at. And right in front of there, we should see the anterior superior iliac spine right here. Again, the one you can put your hand on your hip. You should find then an anterior inferior, which is the one right here, anterior inferior iliac spine. The ones on the back, the big one, the one that sticks out fairly well, but it's in the back is the posterior superior and then of course go down a little bit and you can find the posterior inferior so there are the four spines and the crest of the ilium greater sciatic notch of course is back here right under that posterior inferior spine so there's the greater sciatic notch that means the lesser one is there the lesser sciatic notch and if we remember from the slide before, in between them should be a spine of the ischium, the ischial spine, right there. Now you can see these pubic rami very well from this aspect, so let's check it out. The inferior pubic ramus would be here, pretty much this whole branch right there. So I'll put inferior ramus of the pubis. Here now we can see quite well the superior ramus of the pubic bone. And then sticking out from any aspect, you can see this quite clearly. That's what would meet with the other side to form the pubic symphysis or the symphysis pubis. That would be the pubic crest. There should be fibrocartilage there in between it and the other side when we put them together. Now, of course, the obturator foramen is the hole formed by the pubic bone and the, well, it's actually formed by all three, but mainly the pubic bone and the ischium wrap around that obturator foramen. All right, just as a fun little side note here, whales are mammals, remember. That's the first thing we have to remember about them. They're not fish. They're not like a shark. So whales, if they're mammals, they should have a skeleton that's very similar to ours, and they do. And if you look at a whale's skeleton, you will notice that it does have a pelvis. And the question is, why would it need a pelvis? Remember, this, the function of a pelvis is to attach lower limbs. So are you telling me that a whale has legs? And I actually am telling you that. Let me show you the picture right now. If you look at a whale skeleton, and let me change to say red here. If you look back there, it's got a floating pelvis. And it still has the bones that we think about, right? There's an ilium. There's a pubic bone. There's an ischium. It's still got all three of those bones. It even has a rudimentary femur and a tibia. Now, they're totally inside of the body wall, so you don't see these sticking out like you see the arm, or what we would call the fin sticking out, like up here. But these are mammals, and they do share the same skeletal structure as you did. Now, this suggests that not only are whales definitely related to mammals, but if you look here and follow back through evolutionary history, you can see whales that have changed over time from some land-dwelling critter. Right now, I don't know all the histories of these. I don't want to go over them with you, but if you want to research that on your own, I've left the pictures there. You can uh, Google each name and learn more about them if you want. But whales do have a pelvis because they do have lower limbs, just like you do. All right, hope you enjoyed that one. Thanks for watching it. Uh, check out some other videos in my series if you want to learn more about ANP. See you for the next one. Bye bye.